So hi everyone, um, welcome to the sixth session of the Med AI Group Exchange sessions. So this week we are um, honored to have Angshuman Paul here with us to talk about his research on um, few shot X-ray diagnosis. Um, he's a visiting scholar fellow at the National Institute of Health, and he's broadly interested in machine learning, medical imaging, and computer vision. So, um, as always, let's try to make this session as interactive as possible. Um, and I think, um, Angshuman, you already said that um, you like people to ask you questions whenever they want to stop and ask you. So, yeah, sure. Okay, so let's follow that. And um, without further ado, um, I'll give it, uh, I'll let function take over. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Vandita, and thanks for inviting me um, in this uh, great uh, session. Um, in today's presentation, I will discuss uh, some of our methods that we have worked on recently on few short chest extra diagnosis using clinical images and the images from the published scientific literature. So, um, um, as a postdoctoral fellow at the uh, Clinical Center of the National Institutes of Health, I have been working on this problem for the uh, last couple of years, and I will try to give you a glimpse of a uh, glimpse of what I have been doing uh, so far. Um, so, in this talk, um, I'll briefly discuss what is few short learning and uh, why few short learning might be useful for medical images, and what are the challenges for few short learning in medical images. Um, and then I will present a couple of methods. The first method will focus on few short learning using clinical chest X-ray images. And then I will show a recent method um, um, that focuses on few short learning using chest X-ray images from the published scientific literature. Um, <clears throat> so um, before going into the details of our method, I'd like to give you a brief introduction about few short learning. So few short learning is an attempt to mimic the human cognitive ability. Human being can learn about uh, new concepts only from a few level training data. For example, uh, if we try to teach a kid um, about the appearances of different animals, we need only a few images of each animal to is the kid uh, what a particular animal looks, looks like. However, when this problem comes to uh, recognition of natural images or any other images using modern machine learning methods, we typically need uh, thousands, if not millions of um, annotated examples to train even simple models. Therefore, um, especially modern deep learning methods are usually considered to be data hungry and they need a huge level data for their effective training. Few short learning is an attempt to mimic the human cognitive ability to learn from only a few annotated image examples or annotated uh, data. And it tries to overcome the cards of large annotation. Large annotation is difficult to obtain in many practical scenarios for various different reasons. Um, However, since small training set, with small training set, uh, it is usually difficult to train a deep, uh, deep neural network effectively. Therefore, few short learning has gained uh, tremendous uh, attention of the researchers over the last few years, and researchers have been trying to design few short learning methods for different applications. Um, and if you look at the literature, uh, many researchers have come up with few few short learning methods for uh, different tasks with natural images. Those involve uh, uh, classification of natural images, segmentation of natural images, and many other tasks. However, when we um, look at few, the scenario of few short learning in case of medical images, we do not find a, a plethora of literature for few short learning in medical images. <clears throat> However, if we can design few short learning methods for medical images, that might be uh, significantly useful for different purposes. First of all, uh, few short learning methods might be useful for the diagnosis of rare diseases. Why this is important? Because for rare diseases, we might not have a large number of annotated examples of different, image, uh, of, of different rare diseases. 
Therefore, if you can design a few short learning method where a system can be trained with only a small number of image examples, then, then that kind of system might be useful to learn about or to, uh, to be able to design methods for diagnosis of rare diseases. Additionally, uh, for especially for medical images, uh, the second point is also important that few short learning enables us to work with small level data set. Now, if we can train a system effectively with small level data set, that means we can reduce the need of manual annotation. Um, for medical images, this manual annotation is expert dependent and time consuming. So both from time and cost point of view, if we can design few short learning method, that might be useful in the context of medical images, uh, even considering more common diseases. So if you consider the scenario with rare diseases, or if you consider the scenario with more common diseases, few short learning is useful for, um, um, for designing a diagnosis methods in medical images. Um, now, if we consider few short chest extra diagnosis, which is, the, uh, which is the main focus of today's presentation, there are several challenges. First of all, as obvious, few short learning in few short learning methods, we need to design methods which can learn from a few level examples. On top of that, whenever we consider radiology images, be it uh, X ray or CT or any other uh, radiology imaging modality, uh, that always uh, those kind of images uh, in most cases have some kind of noise. This noise may be generated due to different causes. One cause may be due to the scanner. Uh, there can be noise in the levels as well uh, because large scale um, radiology image data sets, they often use natural language processing techniques to find the levels corresponding to the images. And these NLP techniques often results in noise in the levels as well. So we can have two types of noise, noise in the images and noise in the levels. Um, so alongside learning from a few examples, we need to handle noise. And then since chest X-ray, one chest X-ray might contain multiple findings or multiple diseases and conditions in it, um, we need to find disease specific feature for, a, for the accurate diagnosis of chest X-ray. Therefore, in order to design a few short chest X-ray diagnosis method, we have to handle noise and find disease specific features alongside learning from a few examples. Why these points are important? Because uh, natural images, all kinds of natural images might not have noise. Some of them might not have noise um, or maybe may have less noise compared to uh, chest X-rays or other radiology image modalities. And in natural images, in most cases for natural image classification, the target object is uh, usually uh, much larger. I mean, uh, the size of the target object usually is large compared to the um, complete image size. Therefore, if we compute the ratio of the target object to the image size, that is very high. And it is much higher compared to the lesion size in a chest x-ray, um, a number of lesion size in the chest x-rays um, to the size of the overall chest x-ray image. So small lesions, uh, finding disease specific features from small lesions is more challenging compared to finding object specific features from natural images. Therefore, compared to natural images, these are additional challenges in chest few short chest x-ray diagnosis. So when we try to design a few short chest X-ray diagnosis, we need to um, find solutions for each of these challenges. Now, in order to handle noise, it is shown that ensemble models are useful in handling noise in the data. Um, when we need to learn from a small number of X-rays and we have to find disease specific characteristics um, and especially from small lesions, extraction of salient features from chest excess might be useful. So if we can find salient features from the target lesion, 
that might be more useful in the accurate diagnosis of the lesion. And uh, autoencoders are known to be useful in extracting salient features from an input feature ring. Therefore, to design a few short chest X-ray diagnosis model, we plan to use an autoencoder on some. Um, we proposed uh, two methods for chest extra diagnosis using autoencoder ensemble, and these methods make use of standard clinical images for their training. Um, the first method is uh, called discriminative ensemble learning for future chest extra diagnosis, uh, which was published in Medical Image Analysis a few months ago, and its preliminary version was published in uh, Medical Imaging 2020. So. These both of these methods uh, make use of autoencoder ensemble. Now we know that an autoencoder consists of an encoder and a decoder. Here the encoder uh, consists of a number of encoder layers, for example, E1, E2, E3, and the decoder consists of a number of decoder layers, uh, D3, D2, and D1. Um, when we apply a feature vector to this autoencoder, the encoder maps the input feature vector and creates a hidden state representation Z in the hidden state of the autoencoder. And the decoder performs the exactly opposite operation. It reconstructs uh, the hidden state representation Z um, and find a reconstruction of the input feature vector as X cap. The autoencoder is typically trained by minimizing the reconstruction loss between X cap and X. Now, if we use, typically autoencoder is an unsupervised architecture, but if we try to make autoencoder a supervised, uh, if we try to train autoencoder in a supervised manner, we can use the class levels of the input feature vectors X. Now assume that in the hidden space representation Z, the input feature vectors X uh, creates different clusters with cluster centers at C1, C2, and C3. The different colors in this figure in the hidden space representation indicates the data points belonging to different classes. So here the data points in red are a particular class, data points in blue are different class, data points in yellow are another different class. So assume that these data points form uh, clusters in the hidden space representation. So based on this cluster, if we can, if we use some kind of contrastive loss uh, to minimize the distances between the data points of the same classes and to maximize the distances of the data points uh, between the uh, data points of different classes, then we can have a discriminative representation of the input training data X in the hidden space representation Z. Um, now, if we want to construct an ensemble of this kind of autoencoders, we need to have a number of autoencoders uh, that can be trained in parallel. Uh, from the theory of ensemble learning, if we have, so each autoencoder or each component in the ensemble is called, an, called a weak learner. So here, since we use autoencoder as weak learner, each weak learner needs to be trained differently. So uh, the theory of ensemble suggests that if each weak learner is trained effectively, and if the training is uh, different between, um, between any pair of the weak learner, then the ensemble tends to perform better. Um, I mean, as the difference between the tra uh, uh, training of the weak learner increases, the autoencoder tends to perform better. And as each autoencoder is trained better, um, each autoencoder performs better. So two things we have to ensure that each autoencoder is trained effectively and the training between the successive autoencoders should be different. Now, how to ensure the difference in the training? Uh, to ensure difference, we need to have some kind of randomness in the training. How to introduce randomness? Randomness can be introduced from two sources. One is from using the data and the other one is using the features. Uh, how to introduce randomness using data? Uh, randomness in the data can be 
introduced by training each autoencoder with different bootstrap samples from the training data. I will come to the details of the bootstrap sample a little later. And the, in terms of the feature, the randomness can be introduced by training each autoencoder with different feature subspaces from the input feature space. So if we consider the full training data, and if we can create different data subsets, and if we can project them into different feature subspaces, we can effectively have different training data for each of the autoencoders. Now let's see how we can introduce, uh, uh, how we can find different subsets of the data from the full training data and different subspaces. So first to create different data subsets from the full training data, we use bootstrap sampling. Let us assume that we, we have n number of training data. We randomly select n prime number of training data from this n number of training data. So this n prime number of training data creates the first bootstrap sample. In this way, we can create a second bootstrap sample. Since these data are chosen randomly, uh, therefore the bootstrap sample one, bootstrap sample two, and in that way bootstrap sample t are likely to be different from each other. That is how the randomness in the training data comes in. <clears throat> Thus, we have bootstrap sample one to bootstrap sample T for each of the autoencoder. Now, if we can project these bootstrap samples to different subspaces from the entire feature space, we can effectively have different training data. Now, let's see how we can find different subspaces uh, from the entire feature space. So, Consider the first autoencoder. We do a subspace sampling to find a subspace for this particular autoencoder. Let's say we have some d-dimensional uh, feature space for the input feature vector to the autoencoder. So we first randomly take m number of subspaces from the d-dimensional subspace, uh, d-dimensional feature space. So we have m subspaces. Out of these subspaces we find one subspace that has the highest distance between the clusters. This subspace is designated as the winner subspace. In this way, for each autoencoder, we randomly take m number of subspaces and calculate the separation between the clusters. And for each autoencoder, we find winner subspace. We find one winner subspace. Thus, for each autoencoder, we have a winner subspace and we have a bootstrap sample. So what we do, can we take the bootstrap. Oh, yeah, sorry. Sure. Can I ask a quick question with the yeah, sure. um, subspaces? So yeah. um, when you say you're um, sweeping along the face of subspaces, is it basically varying the dimensionality of the hidden space or is it something else um, that you're at? Like what are the different types of subspaces that you can choose from? Uh, okay, so let's let's assume that we have a d-dimensional feature space. Let's say d is equal to five. So we, out of these five dimensions, we randomly pick up three dimensions and take a uh, so so di let's say we first randomly pick up dimension one, two, and five. So we project so these three uh, so these three dimensions are my uh, uh, actually constructs my random uh, subspace. Mm, I see. Okay. So, so in I, this uh, way, we have m number of subspaces, and we find a winner subspace. Sorry. So the subspace dimension is it like a hyperparameter, or uh, yes. how do you determine? Okay. Yes. The subspace dimension is a hyperparameter. And the clustering is based on uh the subspaces. The clustering is based on uh so so what. So we, when we have the subspace, we project by input training data to that particular subspace. I'm coming to that. So uh, for example, here we have the bootstrap sample and uh, let's see. Um, yeah. So here we have the bootstrap sample and each bootstrap sample is projected to a particular subspace. So, so initially we have the bootstrap sample from the entire training data. And then that bootstrap sample is projected to each of the subspace. And then uh, we find the clusters from the bootstrap samples in that particular subspace. 
and then we calculate the intercluster distances between the clusters in that particular subspace. So when we have uh, for the, the particular subspace for which we have the highest inter average intercluster distances, we consider that to be the winner subspace for that particular bootstrap sample. Okay, got it. Thanks. So that is how we have winner subspace for uh, for each of the autoencoder and we have a bootstrap sample for each of the autoencoder. So, uh, so we have the full training data from which we can we get a bootstrap sample for each autoencoder and we project that bootstrap sample to the winner subspace corresponding to each of the autoencoder. By projecting this, we get effective training data for each of the autoencoder. Since there are randomnesses from two sources, one is uh, in the choice of the bootstrap sample and the other is, choice, uh, other is in the choice of the subspaces, we effectively get different training data for each of the autoencoders. So with these uh, different uh, training data for each of the autoencoder, we train uh, the different autoencoders in parallel. So we have the input training data X from which we can, we can get the different training data for each of the autoencoder, autoencoder one, two, three, and four. With that, we train each of the autoencoder by minimizing the reconstruction loss and the con contrastive loss together. So, once these autoencoders are trained, um, we have the clusters corresponding to the training data in the hidden space of the autoencoder. And since each autoencoder is trained differently, the clusters, uh, the the you know the position of the clusters or the or the uh, or the position of the different data points in the hidden space would be different. Therefore, the clusters would be different, and the cluster centers would be different. So each autoencoder effectively will have different hidden space representation of the training data as can be seen in this figure. Now, uh, based on the quality of training, subsequently we can assign weight to each of the autoencoder. What do I mean by the quality of the training? We assume that if an autoencoder is trained very well, then if we can, if we uh, get clusters, um, from the hidden space representation, uh, the decision about, about the class level of a particular training data from this cluster-based representation should be similar to those decisions taken from the hidden uh, from the representation of the subsequent layers. For example, um, for example, so, uh, so the input data X e should be ideally reconstructed exactly in the, um, I mean, in an ideal reconstruction, we should have exactly X at the output of an autoencoder. Now, if X becomes X1 in the first encoder layer, then the first decoder layer should also have X1 in case of an ideal training, that is we assume. So, by looking at the similarity of the pair of encoder and decoder layers, we assign weights to each autoencoder. And we assume that when we have a good training, then the pair of encoder and decoder layer should have identical representation of the training data. It means that uh, the first encoder layer and the penultimate decoder layer should have identical representation of the training data the second encoder layer and the second last decoder layer should have identical representation of the training data and so on. So based on the selection of the uh, layers, if we have identical, more identical representation of the training data between the pair of encoder and decoder layer, we consider that autoencoder to have better training compared to the other autoencoders. So that autoencoder is assigned higher weight compared to the other autoencoder. In this way, based on the quality of training, we assign weights to each autoencoder. These weights are used down the line during inference. So at test time, when we apply a test data to this uh, autoencoder ensemble, for each autoencoder, we get a hidden space representation of the test data. For autoencoder one, we get the hidden space representation ZT, uh, let's say the ZT uh, is positioned in this particular space, uh, in this particular position uh, in the hidden space representation of the autoencoder. 
and we can see that ZT is closest to the cluster center C1, cluster center of class level one. Therefore, we assign the class level one to this, uh, to this particular test data. Similarly, for autoencoder two, when we apply the same test data, because it has different clusters at its hidden space, we have uh, ZT uh, projected close to cluster center C3. Therefore, we assign class level three corresponding to this particular uh, autoencoder for the test data. Similarly, for each autoencoder, we might have different uh, class levels assigned to it by that particular autoencoder. So each autoencoder assigns a class level to the same test data. Now, since we had already had computed weight based on the quality of training, we perform a weighted voting of these class levels uh, with, with individual weights of the autoencoder. And from this weighted voting, we get the final output class level. So that is how this ensemble works during testing. Now, when we try to perform classification using autoencoder ensemble, we use a query input. And when we apply this uh, query input to the autoencoder ensemble, we get an output class level. So in terms of, so this is how the autoencoder ensemble works. Now, when we try to use this autoencoder ensemble for few short chest extra diagnosis, we consider several facts. First, uh, as I said, uh, it is important to localize the disease specific salient features. Each disease or condition found in chest x-rays uh, presents some salient features or may, um, I should say, each disease and condition may present some salient features in the chest axis. Now, if we can localize these uh, affected region corresponding to a particular disease or condition, then we may be able to find the salient features. But due to contrast and other, other challenges, it might be difficult to localize the affected region from the chest x -ray. Therefore, since accurate localization is challenging, Therefore, finding disease-specific salient features from chest X-rays is also challenging. So instead of directly finding disease-specific salient features for few-shot diagnosis, we take an indirect approach. What we do? We take the entire chest X-ray and apply it to a feature extractor. So the chest X-ray image is applied to a feature extractor, and it extracts some kind of feature vectors from the chest X-ray. Those feature vectors may not uh, ideally represent the disease or underlying disease or condition uh, present in the chest x-ray, but it finds some kind of coarse feature representation from the coarse visual feature representation from the chest x-ray. Now, we apply these coarse feature representation to the uh, ensemble of autoencoders. Since autoencoder is good at finding salient features, we expect that Autoencoder takes this core, coarse feature vectors as input and finds the salient features from this coarse feature vector. Therefore, by this indirect approach, we do not need to localize the uh, lesions corresponding to a particular disease or condition. Uh, in spite of that, we may be able to find out some kind of salient features with the help of the autoencoder. So uh, our entire process pipeline involves a feature extractor, at the first step, which extracts uh, some kind of visual feature vector from the input chest X-ray image. And then that feature vector is applied to the autoencoder ensemble, which performs salient feature extraction. And through the salient features, as I just uh, described, uh, the autoencoder ensemble finds a class level or assigns a class level to this particular feature vector. That is how this entire process pipeline is designed. So uh, to summarize, our entire pipeline consists of two major components. One is the feature extractor, and the other one is the autoencoder ensemble. <coughs> so uh, the problem is, uh, when, when we try to uh, use a feature extractor, um, especially when we try to use a, a deep neural network based feature extractor. The problem is uh, we may not be able to train a, such a feature extractor, a deep feature extractor using only a handful of uh, image examples. 
because this is why this is important because uh, we have only a handful of image examples corresponding to uh, each disease or conditions of our consideration. Uh, so uh, um, we have to take, uh, we have to find a way out to train uh, the deep feature extractor for our uh, few short learning tasks or other, or other feature extraction tasks. Therefore, we divide uh, all the chest diseases and conditions, or we divide all the, all the target classes into two categories. One is called the base classes, and the other one is called the novel classes. Base classes are the one for which we assume that we have a large number of, uh, or large number of annotated training examples. And the novel classes are the one for which we have only a few annotated training examples per class. So consider a problem where we have 12 different classes, C1 to C12. We assume that C1 to C8, these eight classes are base classes for which we have a large number of training examples and the rest four classes, C9 to C12 are novel classes for which we have only, uh, uh, only a few for our problem, only five annotated training examples. Our goal is to uh, use the base classes in a way so that we can gain some knowledge from the base classes and transfer those that knowledge for the identification of the novel classes. How that transfer is performed? That transfer of knowledge is performed using the feature extractor. We train the feature extractor using the base classes. The feature extractor in our problem is designed using a dense net one-to-one -one model, and that is trained using only the base classes. Now, once the feature extractor is trained, we can apply the chest extra images of the novel classes to the feature extractor, and it will give us some kind of feature vectors. But here is a point to remember. Since this feature extractor is trained using the images of the base classes, when we apply the images of the novel classes, the extracted feature vectors might be noisy because it, the feature extractor does not have any information about the novel classes. So these feature vectors might be noisy and some, some dimensions might be redundant. Uh, now we apply these feature vectors to the autoencoder ensemble. Since autoencoder deals with salient, uh, uh, helps to extract salient features and makes decision using the salient features. Therefore, although these feature vectors are noisy, autoencoder can still make good decision using these feature vectors. So uh, there comes the role of the autoencoder ensemble. This autoencoder ensemble is, uh, is trained using only the feature vectors corresponding to the novel classes. Remember, that for the novel classes, we have only five annotated image examples, therefore, per class. So therefore, the autoencoder ensemble is trained effectively with only five annotated image examples per novel class. Once the autoencoder ensemble is trained, if we apply a query image of the novel class, the feature extractor extracts the feature vectors and applies it simultaneously to each autoencoder in the ensemble. Each autoencoder assigns a class level, we perform, eventually perform a weighted voting with all these class levels and we get a final output class level corresponding to the input chest X-ray. That is how our entire few short learning pipeline works. So uh, these process pipeline can be described in terms of uh, met meta learning framework as well. So as we know in meta learning, there are two major phases. One is called meta training and the other one is called uh, meta testing. In meta training phase, uh, usually the base classes are exploited to train uh, the classifier. And then in meta testing phase, there is also a training and test phase. Uh, so in the training phase of meta testing, we use uh, a few examples of the, uh, of the novel classes to train the classifier and then at the, at the test phase of meta testing, we finally do the inference. Now, if we try to look at our model from a meta learning point of view, uh, we can see that at the training phase of meta training, we actually train the feature extractor, where we use the images of the base classes to train the feature extractor. 
Now, once the feature extractor is trained, we can extract uh, feature vector corresponding to the uh, images of the novel classes. Now, using the training images, five training images per novel class, we train the auto encoder ensemble. This is actually the training phase of beta testing. Now, when the auto encoder ensemble is trained, we finally can apply the test image of the meta test set. Uh, and uh, we can get a feature vector uh, for which uh, we can, uh, I, which is eventually applied to the trained auto encoder ensemble. And through the weighted coating, we get a final output class level. This is the test phase of meta testing. So that is how, from the meta learning point of view, we can also explain uh, the different steps of our method. One interesting thing to observe here, usually, uh, for most of the meta learning frameworks, uh, one classifier model is used and that is trained during the meta training as well as uh, during the training phase of meta testing. However, in our design, during meta training, during the training phase of meta training, we train the feature extractor and during the training phase of meta testing, we train the auto encoder also. So the training phase of meta training and the training phase of meta testing is architecturally disjoint as well. Not, not only they are sequentially disjoint, they are also architecturally disjoint. This gives us an additional advantage to modify either the training phase of meta training or the training phase of meta testing by changing the suitable component. For example, if we want to improve the training phase of meta training, we can just train the feature, we can just change the feature extractor and keep the rest of the architecture same and uh, and see how how the new uh, feature extractor performs so so changing the different phases of meta training and meta testing uh, is much easier since they are architecturally disjoint and this gives us one more advantage that if we want to use this kind of model for other imaging modalities like for example if we want to use this for the um, for the city image diagnosis we may need to change only the feature extractor because we, if we have a suitable feature extractor for city, we can still use those feature vectors with the same auto encoder ensemble. Uh, architecture of the auto encoder en ensemble, we may not need to change. We may need to retrain it, but we may not need to change the architecture of the auto encoder ensemble. So uh, this gives us, this possibly gives us an advantage uh, in terms of the architecture of the design. So for our experiments, we use um, two different data sets, NIH chest X-ray data set and the OpenAI data set. And we use uh, 14 different uh, diseases and conditions um, that are typically found from chest X-rays. And these are the diseases and conditions that are associated with the NIH chest X-ray data set. Uh, these are listed in this particular table. And there is also no finding uh, if the chest X-ray is normal, then this no finding level is assigned. So altogether, we have 15 different diseases or conditions, or let's say 15 different levels corresponding to the uh, chest X-rays. So from these 15 different levels, since we need to divide the target levels into base and novel classes, we create five different combinations of base and novel classes from these 15 levels. These are the combinations. So in combination one, hernia, pneumonia, and fibrosis are novel classes, and the rest 12 are base classes. Similarly, in combination two, these three are novel classes, and rest 12 are base classes. In the same way, we have um, five different combinations of base and novel class. For each combination of base and novel class, we independently perform all our experiments. So, Whatever experiments I would, uh, whatever experimental results I would show you next in the next couple of slides, those are based on experiments with a particular combination of base and novel classes. So when we perform uh, experiments on combination one, then we do not uh, do not consider anything about combination two, three, four, or five in that way. Um, so. For each combination, when we consider a particular combination, we have five training data per novel class, as I said. Um, we train our model using the NIH training set and we test on 
OpenAI data set as well as the NIH test set. Um, we deliberately don't use OpenAI data set during training in order to see the generalizability of the training across different data sets. So I would like to show you the results uh, of our method in terms of F1 score for detecting particular diseases or conditions. Um, first on the OpenAI data set. And uh, these are the results in comparison with several other methods, including some traditional methods like Adaboost Random Forest Support Vector Machine and some, um, uh, some well-known few short learning methods like Model Agnostic Meta Learning, Prototypical Network, MetaOpNet, and ONIL. So um, if you see the results um, for different diseases and conditions, following that particular combinations of uh, base and novel classes. So if you see the results in most occasions, you will see that uh, if we consider one method that performs better compared to the other methods for most of the diseases and conditions, uh, you will see that that particular method in most cases is our method. So here are the results for five different diseases and conditions when they are treated as novel classes. Here we have results for other five different diseases and conditions. The same trend about the superiority of our method can be seen here as well. And here also, you can see for the other five different diseases and conditions, our method tends to perform better compared to other methods in terms of the F1 scores. Um, Just a quick question. Uh, yeah, sure. For the uh, neural network-based baselines, did you use the same autoencoder architecture, et cetera, to, as the base predictor, or what did you use? Uh, for for, for which, let's say mammal, so, or mammal for mammal, for mammal, what, what, what? Yeah, what? yeah. We yeah. use the similar architectures. Okay. Uh, another quick question here. So, uh, chest the the chest sensory images might be associated with multiple labels, multiple diseases. Um. So yeah, are you predicting like multi labels here? Or? Right. Uh, for this these methods, we cannot predict multiple levels. Uh, we predict only one level. And uh, our consideration is that if that particular predicted level matches with one of the ground truth levels of the query image, we consider that as a true positive detection. Okay, I see. So yeah, so that is a drawback of the proposed method. We don't, don't use this method for predicting multiple levels. Okay. Um, yeah, so one point that I was trying, uh, trying to show you that for many uh, diseases and conditions, we, uh, for some of the diseases and conditions, we have F1 score as high as 0.7 or 0.8, but for a number of diseases and conditions, we do not have very high F1 scores. So that is a problem with, uh, with the few short learning method, but uh, I guess because we use only a, only a handful of training examples to, uh, to uh, train our model, that is why we, we are not getting very good F1 scores for all the diseases and conditions. And uh, similar trends can be also, can also be seen for the, uh, if we consider the results on the NIH chest X-ray data set. Um, so uh, here we have shown, uh, along with the other methods, we have shown the results of one, one baseline method and actually two baseline methods. Um, and it can be seen that in terms of the F1 score for most of the diseases and conditions, our methods perform superior uh, compared to other uh, competing approaches. So here are the results for three diseases and conditions. Here are the results for other three diseases and conditions. Next three. And these are the final set of diseases and conditions. Um, alongside this, uh, 
We also try to evaluate the utility of our design and the architecture. For that purpose, uh, we perform a several ablation studies. We use, uh, to, to look into the utility of the ensemble design, we use single autoencoder abbreviated as SAE. We use autoencoder with equal weight where we do not uh, assign weights to the autoencoder based on their quality of training. And we also use autoencoder without feature selection. Uh, without feature selection means we do not uh, find the winner subspace from the set of M subspaces, as I mentioned, we randomly choose a subspace. So uh, by doing this uh, ablation studies, we find that in most cases, the proposed method performs, uh, has better performance compared to the other, uh, other studies. I mean, if you consider one method that has better results compared to other methods in most cases, that is the proposed method. Similar trends can be observed in the NIH dataset as well. And this shows the utility of the design. Um, although we do not have clear advantage in all the different diseases and conditions, we assume that uh, uh, we do not have clear advantage compared to other uh, methods or other ablation studies in all diseases and conditions because some diseases are more difficult to detect compared to other diseases. Uh, so that might present a difficulty uh, for the proposed method for better diagnosis. We also look into, uh, uh, look into the impact of the number of autoencoders in the ensemble. So we tested with different number of autoencoders in the ensemble, 5, 10, 15, 20, and 25. We see that for this open eye data set, in most cases, we, we find the best result with 15 autoencoders, but in some cases, we also find uh, good results with other, other number of autoencoders as well. In the NIH data set also, most of the results are, most of the better results are obtained with 15 autoencoders, although that is not consistent across all the diseases and conditions. Uh, therefore, to, to conclude about this, this part of the uh, method, um, it, is, it is seen that for few short diagnosis, the proposed method uh, can, be of, uh, can, be, can be useful, but it is difficult to find any clear trend about the number of uh, autoencoders in the ensemble, or um, it is difficult to find a clear trend about the superiority of the ensemble or the superiority of the uh, use of the weights across all the diseases and conditions, at least for some of the diseases and conditions, uh, uh, or, or let's say most of the diseases and conditions, the proposed method is better than others, but not for all of them. So uh, finally, I'll just briefly tell you about, uh, so do you have any questions with this uh, method before I move into the next one? Uh, I had one quick question. Uh, yeah. Did you keep the autoencoder architecture consistent across all autoencoder uh, autoencoders in the ensemble? And yes. I see. Yes. For all the diseases and conditions we used for all our experiments with uh, different number of autoencoders and ablation studies, we kept the autoencoder architecture consistent. Okay. And you chose this um, um, this particular autoencoder architecture based on a hyperparameter search or was it fixed based on something else? Yeah, I mean, through some cross validations, we, we found this architecture. Thank you. Uh, I had another quick question. Uh, sure. I was wondering if there was any sort of data curation done uh, to feed into the few shot learning. So I know for a lot of real life cases and for a lot of um, like active learning sort of methods, you have, you try to use very cheap data. So again, the, the sort of data that's, uh, I guess, very far from the decision boundary versus um, maybe if you know, uh, if there was or wasn't any data curation uh, that might right. affect the training or I guess the effectiveness? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Actually, uh, we did not curate any data. I mean, we did not choose any particular type of data for our training. Actually, we, uh, we had performed 10 rounds of experiments with random sampling 
of the five data points for the novel classes. And uh, these standard deviation values, as you can see from these tables or, or uh, these error bars in these figures, that are results for uh, those variation of the input data. So uh, this is also, I mean, uh, we found that if we use particularly better representative data for a particular disease or conditions, we might get better results, but we consider the fact that we may not be able to get uh, or hand, I mean, um, hand pick those kind of training data in every scenario. Therefore, we randomly chose the training data and we did 10 rounds of several rounds of experiments, 10 rounds in most cases, and then reported the standard deviation values on those. These are the standard deviation values. Right. I guess I guess I was also kind of thinking that um, there was, I guess, maybe a little bit of curation in a sense that uh, you said uh, the ones with multi labels were not included. And again, that is that would be, you know, part of that decision boundary that would be difficult to do. So I guess I was just wondering if you guys did any more additional curation. Oh, uh, no, I'm sorry for the confusion, but um, we we use the data with multiple levels, but I just said that for a query image with multiple levels, if the predicted level matches with one of the ground truth levels, we consider that as true positive. Uh, not that we did not use multiple levels. We used multiple levels, but that is how we made the decisions for the query image. Okay, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so I'll quickly move to the uh, next part, uh, which is future chest X-ray diagnosis using images from the published scientific literature. And this paper has been published in ISBI 2021. Um, so why, uh, why this method is important is because if we try to learn something from the X-ray images or any other radiology images from the published literature, we face with several challenges. These are some image examples from published scientific literature. One obvious difference from, of these images from the clinical chest X-ray is that the presence of artifacts. And in many occasions, uh, these images are of lower resolution compared to standard clinical chest X-ray. Therefore, making any decision for, uh, by training a model with these kind of images is more challenging compared to uh, training a model with standard clinical X-ray images. However, uh, the motivation for designing such a method is that uh, when a, in, in a real life, a radiologist might follow um, a similar strategy to learn about new diseases and conditions. A radiologist uh, may have knowledge about several diseases and conditions in chest X-ray and when the radiologist learns about a new disease and the presentation of this, that disease in chest X-ray from a literature, with only a few image examples of that particular disease, the radiologist learns about, uh, learns to identify that disease or learns to diagnose that disease from the chest X-ray. So often a radiologist learns from published scientific literature using the, using the previous knowledge and uh, the information presented in the literature. So we try to mimic a similar strategy by designing a method that may be able to learn from the images in the published scientific literature. Uh, for this uh, method, we use labeled images from published scientific literature at PubMed Central. So we design a few short classifier which, uh, for which the initial training is performed using the images from the PubMed Center. And then we also use high resolution images from the NIH chest X-ray data set for retraining of the classifier without using the label of these images. So for the low resolution or uh, uh, for the um, images from the published scientific literature, we use the labels, but for the high resolution images, we do not use labels. Therefore, the labeled images are used only for the uh, low resolution or images or the images with the artifacts. 
so the process pipeline is kind of similar to what i have presented before we here also we use an auto encoder based architecture for classification purpose but instead of an ensemble we use a single auto encoder uh, the role of the ensemble in removing or dealing with noise is taken care of to some extent by the retraining with the unlabeled data so uh, here is the process pipeline when we apply an input image the feature extractor which is similar to the feature extractor as i discussed before extracts a feature vector and that is applied to a classifier which predicts a level for this input now for the initial training of this classifier we use images possibly of low resolution and with presence of artifact from the pubmed sensor those images are applied to the feature extractor which is trained with the base classes from the nihs texture data set but these feature extractor does not have any information about the novel class images from the pubmed sensor so we get a feature vector which is likely to be noisy uh, Uh, corresponding to these images from the pubmed central and with this feature vector this auto encoder based classifier is trained now to design the loss function of this uh, of this classifier we use the reconstruction loss as i mentioned before a standard reconstruction loss of the auto encoder alongside that we also compute loss from the cluster so as i said before when we apply an input training data we get the cluster best uh, representation of we can get the cluster best representation of the training data in the hidden space and to have a discriminative representation uh, in the hidden space we would like to minimize these distances uh, dij which is the distance between the data points of the same classes and we would like to we would like to maximize the inter cluster distances which is the distance between two cluster center which is denoted by rn corresponding to that we design two loss components one is called the condensation loss which try to minimize these dij values and other is called the separation loss uh, which try to maximize these rav values these are contrastive loss components and these are used along with the reconstruction loss with two hyperparameters lambda 1 and um, lambda 2 as the loss function of the classifier by minimizing this loss function we train the classifier and then we apply high resolution images from the nie chest x-ray data set which are unlabeled to this feature extractor and subsequently to this classifier now since the classifier is already trained using the images from the pubmed central this classifier can assign a label to each of these input unlabeled images these labels are called pseudo labels so when we apply these unlabeled images we can get a pseudo levels corresponding to each unlabeled image now with the pseudo levels we retrain this classifier what is the advantage of this retraining uh, the possible advantage is that these images uh, which are used for retraining are high resolution images therefore these high resolution images may contain more Uh, useful information about particular diseases and conditions which is helpful in improving the training of the classifier that is how retraining is likely to help uh, in uh, in reducing the impact of noise and get a better training of the classifier finally when we apply a query image similarly we get a feature extract a feature vector first when we apply it to a classifier we get a predicted level corresponding to the query image. so for this particular study we use only one set of base and novel classes so these are the base classes as indicated here and only one set of novel classes uh, which which are edema emphysema and cardiomegaly so the performance as uh, as i mentioned before is evaluated only on the novel class so overall the initial training of the classifier is performed using the pubmed central images the retraining is performed using the images from the nih training set and the test or the inference has been performed using that nih chest x set test data set and the target abnormalities or the novel classes are cardiomegaly emphysema and edema um so these are the results 
some of the results in terms of the F1 score and AUROC of the proposed method and some of the other methods, MAML, ProtonNet, MetaOpNet, and this EAE is the ensemble of autoencoders, which is uh, ensemble without using this cluster-based loss term. And you can see that for most of the occasions, uh, the proposed method performs better compared to the other uh, few short learning methods. However, as I mentioned before, here also the AUROC values or the F1 scores are not too high, but the proposed method achieves better compared to the others, most cases. Um, here we have shown some of the image examples with uh, ground truth and the detected levels. Uh, these two are, uh, these for these two images, the levels are correctly detected. And for this image, the level is incorrectly detected. We have also performed a number of ablation studies to, to look into the impact of retraining and to look into the impact of cluster-based losses in the autoencoder. So this WRT, um, is the result uh, is the experiments without retraining, and this AERE is the experiments without uh, using the cluster based loss in the autoencoder. So, this AERE is the autoencoder with only the reconstruction loss. Um, so, you can see for most of the diseases and conditions, or uh, I should say for all of the diseases and conditions, we have better results using the proposed method compared to the other ablation study. So this shows the utility of our retraining-based design and the utility of the cluster-based loss forms. So uh, that is how we have designed two uh, methods for few short chest X-ray diagnosis. Uh, one purely using clinical images and the other one using uh, images from the published scientific literature alongside unleveled clinical images. And in the second method, uh, where we use uh, images from the published scientific literature, we try to mimic the learning uh, of a radiologist, where we use the high resolution images of a set of diseases to train the feature extractor, uh, which is used for knowledge transfer about the novel classes. And then few low resolution images from the published scientific literature is about a new disease is used for training the classifier. The retraining with pseudo levels seems to uh, improve the training of the classifier, and we have uh, we would like to extend this method for other combinations of base and novel classes as well. Uh, this kind of so this is one of the first uh, method that attempts to use few short learning for chest extra diagnosis. Uh, although our results are not um, as good as fully supervised methods with a lot of training data. However, this kind of methods, if this can be improved down the line further, this can be used for uh, rare disease diagnosis where we can actually have uh, less number of training data for training a deep learning model. So um, yeah, that's, that's it about my presentation. So if you have any questions, you may please ask. Thanks, Anshu, and that was a really great talk. Um, I think a few people had to drop off um, at two, but if anybody else has questions, um, please ask them now, or you can also ask them um, um, in our Google form that we have on our website, or you can also contact Anshu directly. So I'll leave the floor open for questions for a few minutes, and then we can. Uh, I'm just curious, how do you obtain those uh, low resolution images from the literature? Oh, uh, those are obtained from uh, the open access subset uh, of the PubMed Central. So our collaborator at the National Library of Medicine has designed some uh, methods for mining those images from uh, the articles of PubMed Central. Um, and uh, that uses some natural language processing techniques to find the levels corresponding to each of the images. Okay. By looking at the caption and the corresponding text. Okay, so basically the labels as well as the images are pretty noisy. Uh... Yeah, that may be noisy, uh, uh, 
but since we used, uh, I mean, uh, NLP based method to extract the labels from the caption and a radiologist examine the labels, we expect them to be less noisy just compared to just by uh, using only the NLP based method. Okay, okay, got it. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, if not, um, let's give our speaker um, virtual applause. Thanks, Anshuman. It's pretty late for you, and so we really appreciate you staying up. No problem. And so we'll Thank have you. the um, video uploaded on our YouTube channel as well, so you can all view it later. And 